Don Quixote was a virgin. Bettina first felt a man's hand on her breast at the age of 25, when she was alone with Goethe in a Teplitz hotel room. If we can trust biographers, Goethe first experienced physical love during his trip to Italy, when he was almost 40 years old. Soon after his return, he met a 23-year-old Weimar working woman and turned her into his first lasting mistress. She was Christiane Volpius, who in 1806, after many years of cohabitation, became his legal wife and who knocked off Bettina's glasses in that memorable year of 1811. She was faithfully devoted to her husband. It is said that she protected him with her own body when he was threatened by drunken soldiers from Napoleon's army. And she was evidently also an excellent lover, as we may judge from Goethe's joking reference to her as mein Bettschatz, my bed treasure. Nevertheless, in Goethean hagiography, Christiane finds herself outside the bounds of love. The 19th century, but also our own time, which is still imprisoned by the past century, refuses to admit Christiane into the gallery of Goethe's lovers, alongside Frederica, alongside Frederica, Lot, Lily, Bettina, and Ulrika. You may say that this is simply due to the fact that she was his wife and we have become accustomed to consider marriage automatically as something unpoetical. I believe, however, that the actual reason goes deeper. The public refuses to see Christiane as one of Goethe's loves simply because Goethe slept with her. For love treasure and bed treasure were mutually exclusive entities. 19th century writers often ended their novels with marriage. This was not because they wanted to save the love story from marital boredom. No, they wanted to save it from intercourse. All the great European love stories take place in an extracoital setting, the story of the Princess of Cleves, the story of Paul and Virginia, the story of Fromentin's Dominique, who loves only one woman all his life without so much as kissing her, and of course the stories of Werther, of Hampson's Victoria, and Romain Rolland's story of Peter and Luce, which once made women readers weep across Europe. In his novel The Idiot, Dostoevsky let Nastasia Filipovna sleep with any merchant who came along. But when real passion was involved, namely when she found herself torn between Prince Mishkin and Rogozhin, their sexual organs dissolved in their three great hearts like lumps of sugar and three cups of tea. The love of Anna Karenina and Vronsky ended with their first sexual encounter, after which it became nothing but a story of its own disintegration, and we hardly know why. Had they made love so poorly? Or, on the contrary, had they made love so beautifully that the intensity of their pleasure released a sense of guilt? No matter how we answer, we always reach the same conclusion. There was no great love after precoital love, and there couldn't be. This does not mean that extracoital love was innocent, angelic, childlike, pure. On the contrary, it contained every bit of hell imaginable in the world. Nastasia Filipovna went safely to bed with a lot of vulgar rich men, but from the moment she met Prince Mishkin and Rogozhin, whose sex organs, as I said, dissolved in the great samovar of feeling, she found herself in the region of catastrophe and died. Or let me remind you of that beautiful scene in Fromentin's Dominique. The two lovers, who yearned for each other for years without ever as much as touching, went out riding, and the gentle, refined, reserved Madeline proceeded to whip her horse into a mad gallop because she knew that Dominique, who followed her and was a bad rider, might get killed. Extracoital love, a pot on the fire, in which feeling boils to a passion and makes the lid shake and dance like a soul possessed. The concept of European love has its roots in extracoital soil. The 20th century, which boasts that it liberated morals and likes to laugh at romantic feelings, was not capable of filling the concept of love with any new content. This is one of its debacles. So the young European who silently pronounces that great word to himself willy-nilly returns on the wings of enthusiasm to precisely the same point where Werther lived his great love for Lot and where Dominique nearly fell off his horse. Typically, just as Rilke admired Bettina, he also admired Russia for a certain period of time and for a certain period of time liked to think of it as his spiritual homeland. For Russia is the land of Christian sentimentality par excellence. It escaped both the rationalism of medieval scholastic philosophy and the Renaissance. 
The modern age, based on Cartesian critical thought, only penetrated there after a lag of some one or two hundred years. Homo sentimentalis thus failed to find there a sufficient counterweight and became his own hyperbole commonly known as the Slavic soul. Russia and France are the two poles of Europe that exercise eternal mutual attraction. France is an old, tired country where nothing remains of feelings but forms. A Frenchman may write at the end of a letter, quite, quote, Be so kind, dear sir, as to accept the assurance of my delicate feelings, end of quote. The first time I got such a letter, signed by a secretary of the publishing house Gallimard, I was still living in Prague. I jumped in the air for joy. In Paris, there is a woman who loves me. She managed to slip a declaration of love into a business letter. She not only has feelings for me, but she expressly states that they are delicate. Never in my life had a Czech woman said anything of the kind to me. Only years later was it explained to me in Paris that there exists a whole semantic repertory of closing formulas for letters. Thanks to these formulas, a Frenchman can determine with the precision of a pharmacist the most subtle degree of feelings that he wants to transmit to the addressee without feeling them himself. On this scale, quote, delicate feelings, end of quote, expresses the lowest degree of official politeness, bordering almost on contempt. Oh, France, you are the land of form, just as Russia is the land of feeling. That is why the Frenchman, eternally frustrated by not feeling any flame burning in his breast, gazes with envy and nostalgia toward the land of Dostoevsky, where men offer their puckered lips to other men and would cut the throat of anyone refusing their kiss. Besides, if they did cut anyone's throat, they would be forgiven immediately, for it was their injured love that made them do it. And, as we know from Bettina... Love makes people innocent. A lovesick murderer will find at least 120 lawyers in Paris ready to send a special train to Moscow to defend him. They will not be driven to do so by compassion, a feeling too exotic and seldom practiced at home, but by abstract principles, their sole passion. The Russian murderer will fail to understand this and once free will rush at his French defense lawyer to hug him and kiss him on the mouth. The Frenchman will back away in horror. The Russian will take offense, plunge a knife into his body, and the, horror, and the whole story will repeat itself like the song about the dog and the crust of bread. Ah, the Russians. While I was still living in Prague, the following anecdote went around about the Russian soul. A Czech man seduces a Russian woman with devastating speed. After intercourse, the Russian woman says to him with boundless contempt, you had my body, but you'll never have my soul. A splendid anecdote. Bettina wrote a total of 49 letters to Goethe. The word soul appears 50 times. The word heart 119 times. The word heart is seldom used in a literal anatomic sense, my heart pounded. More often it is used as a synecdoche, designating the breast. I would like to press you to my heart. But in the vast majority of cases, it means the same as the word soul, the feeling self. I think, therefore, I am is the statement of an intellectual who understates toothaches. Excuse me. I think, therefore, I am is the statement of an intellectual who underrates toothaches. I feel, therefore, I am is a truth much more universally valid, and it applies to everything that's alive. Myself does not differ substantially from yours in terms of its thought. Many people, few ideas. We all think more or less the same, and we exchange, borrow, steal thoughts from one another. However, when someone steps on my foot, only I feel the pain. The basis of the self is not thought, but suffering, which is the most fundamental of all feelings. While it suffers, not even a cat can doubt its unique and uninterchangeable self. In intense suffering, the world disappears and each of us is alone with his self. Suffering is the university of egocentrism.
Do you feel contempt for me? Hippolyte asked Prince Mishkin. Why should I feel contempt because you suffered and continue to suffer more than we? No, because I am not worthy of my suffering. I am not worthy of my suffering, a great sentence. It suggests not only that suffering is the basis of the self, its sole indubitable ontological proof, but also that it is the one feeling most worthy of respect, the value of all values. That's why Mishkin admires all women who suffer. When he saw a photograph of Nastasia Filipovna for the first time, he said, quote, that woman must have suffered a great deal, end of quote. Those words determined right from the start, even before we saw her on the stage of the novel, that Nastasia Filipovna stood far higher than all the others. Quote, I am nothing but you, you have suffered, end of quote, said the bewitched Mishkin to Nastasia in the 15th chapter of the first part. And from that moment on, he is lost. I said that Mishkin admired all women who suffered, but I could also turn this statement around. From the moment some woman pleased him, he imagined her suffering. And because he was incapable of keeping his thoughts to himself, he immediately made this known to the woman. Besides, it was an outstanding method of seduction. What a pity that Mishkin did not know how to make better use of it. For if we say to any woman, you have suffered a great deal, it is as if we celebrated her soul, stroked it, lifted it high, any woman is ready to tell us at such a moment, even though you still don't have my body, my soul already belongs to you. Under Mishkin's gaze, the soul grows and grows. It resembles a giant mushroom as high as a five-story building. It resembles a hot air balloon about to rise into the sky with its crew. We have reached a phenomenon that I call hypertrophy of the soul. When Goethe received from Bettina the sketch for his monument, you may remember that he had a tear in his eye and he was certain that his inmost self was thereby letting him know the truth. Bettina truly loved him and he had wronged her. He realized only later that the tear revealed no remarkable truth about Bettina's devotion, but only the banal truth of his own vanity. He was ashamed for having once again given in to the demagogy of his own tears. Since turning 50, he had had much experience with tears. Every time somebody praised him or he was gratified by some beautiful or benevolent deed he had performed, his eyes grew moist. What is a tear? He asked himself without ever finding the answer. But one thing was clear to him. A tear was suspiciously often provoked by the emotion brought on by Goethe's contemplation of Goethe. About a week after the terrible death of Agnes, Laura visited a despondent Paul. Paul, she said, we're alone in the world now. Paul's eyes grew moist and he turned his head to hide his emotion from Laura. But it was precisely this movement of the head that induced Laura to grasp him firmly by the arm. Don't cry, Paul. Paul looked at Laura through his tears and saw that her eyes too were moist. He smiled and said in a faltering voice, I'm not crying, you're crying.
if there is anything at all you need, Paul, you know that I am here, that you can count on me. And Paul answered, I know. The tear in Laura's eye was the tear of emotion Laura felt over Laura's determination to sacrifice her whole life to stand by the side of her deceased sister's husband. The tear in Paul's eye was the tear of emotion Paul felt over the faithfulness of Paul, who could never live with any other woman except the shadow of his dead wife, her likeness, her sister. Unbelievable. And so one day they lay down together on the broad bed and the tear, the mercy of the tear, made them feel no sense of betrayal toward the deceased. The old art of erotic ambiguity came to their aid. They lay side by side, not like husband and wife, but like siblings. Until now, Laura had been taboo for Paul. He probably had never connected her with any sexual imaginings, not even in some far corner of his mind. Now he felt like her brother who had to replace her lost sister. At the start, that made it morally possible for him to go to bed with her, and later it filled him with a totally unknown excitement. They knew everything about each other, like brother and sister, and what separated them was not the strangeness, but prohibition. This prohibition had lasted 20 years, and with the passage of time was becoming more and more insurmountable. Nothing was closer than the other's body. Nothing was more prohibited than the other's body. And so, with an incestuous excitement and with misty eyes, he began to make love to her, and he made love to her more wildly than he had ever done with anyone in his entire life. There are civilizations that have had greater architecture than Europe and Greek Taj... Let me start again. <laughs> There are civilizations that have had greater architecture than Europe, and Greek tragedy will forever remain unsurpassed. However, no civilization has ever created such a miracle out of musical sounds as European music, with its thousand-year-old history and its wealth of forms and styles. Europe, great music, and homo sentimentalis, twins, nurtured side by side in the same cradle. Music taught the European not only a richness of feeling, but also the worship of his feelings and his feeling self. After all, you are familiar with this situation. The violinist standing on the platform closes his eyes and plays the first two long notes. At that moment, the listener also closes his eyes, feels his soul expanding in his breast, and says to himself, how beautiful. And yet he hears only two notes, which in themselves could not possibly contain anything of the composer's ideas, any creativity, in other words, any art or beauty. But those two notes have touched the listener's heart and silenced his reason and aesthetic judgment. Mere musical sound performs approximately the same effect upon us as Mishkin's gaze fixed upon a woman. Music, a pump for inflating the soul. Hypertrophic souls turned into huge balloons rise to the ceiling of the concert hall and jostle each other in unbelievable congestion. Laura loved music sincerely and deeply. I recognize the precise significance of her love for Mahler. Mahler is the last great European composer who still appeals, naively and directly, to homo sentimentalis. After Mahler, feeling in music starts to become suspicious. Debussy wants to enchant us, not to move us. And Stravinsky is ashamed of emotion. Mahler is for Laura the ultimate composer, and when she hears loud rock music coming from Bridget's room, her wounded love for European music vanishing in the din of electric guitars drives her to fury. She gives Paul an ultimatum, either Mahler or Rock, meaning either me or Bridget. But how is one to choose between two equally unloved kinds of music? Rock is too loud for Paul. Like Goethe, he has delicate ears. 
while romantic music evokes in him feelings of anxiety. During the war, when everybody around him was disturbed by panicky reports, the tangos and waltzes usually played on the radio were replaced by minor key chords of serious, solemn music. In the child's memory, these chords became forever engraved as harbingers of catastrophe. Later, he realized that the pathos of romantic music united all Europe. It can be heard every time some statesman is murdered or war is declared, every time it is necessary to stuff people's heads with glory to make them die more willingly. Nations that tried to annihilate each other were filled with the identical fraternal emotion when they heard the thunder of Chopin's funeral march or Beethoven's Eroica. Ah, uh, if only it depended on Paul, the world could get along very well without Rock and without Mahler. However, the two women did not permit him neutrality. They forced him to choose between two kinds of music, between two women. And he didn't know what to do because both women were equally dear to him. Yet the two women hated each other. Bridget looked with painful sorrow at the white piano, which had served no function for years except as a makeshift shelf. It reminded her of Agnes, who out of love for her sister had pleaded with Bridget to learn to play it. As soon as Agnes died, the piano came to life and resounded every day. Bridget hoped that Furious Rock would revenge her betrayed mother and chase the intruder from the house. When she realized that Laura was staying, she left herself. Rock was heard no more. Records re revolved on the record player. Mahler's trombones rang through the room and tore at Paul's heart, still pining for his daughter. Laura approached Paul, grasped his head with both hands, and looked into his eyes. Then she said, I'd like to give you a child. Both of them, them knew that doctors had already warned her a long time before not to have any children. That's why she added, I am ready to do whatever is necessary. It was summertime. Laura closed her shop and the two of them left for a week, two week seaside vacation. The waves dashed against the shore and their call filled Paul's breast. The music of this element was the only kind that he loved passionately. He discovered with happy surprise that Laura merged with this music. The only woman in his life whom he found to resemble the sea who was the sea.